from the Mercy One Studio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Welcome, folks, to the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We are coming to you from these United States of America here in Des Moines, Iowa, where I, at Mercy College, am the Senior Advisor to the President for Mission Initiatives and Spiritual Health and also the Director of the newly founded Center for Human Form- uh, Human Flourishing. Bud, what do you do at Ye Old Mercy College? <laughs> I'm the uh, Academic Dean there at Mercy College of Health Sciences. And so we are, uh, I don't know if we really are breathing a sigh of relief, but we just got done graduating a whole new group of graduates. So that means uh, that the spring semester is done for us. Now, of course, at Mercy, we do uh, three semesters to try to get people into uh, the, the field of nursing as quickly as possible. But, but have you been able to take a breather and a break in any way at all? Oof. Speaking honestly, not yet. <laughs> uh, just heading up academic affairs when the semester wraps up. You have a lot of um, yeoman's work. I'm not complaining. It just is what it is. So maybe next week. That's right. You'll be able to see Bud out. I mean, the weather's warm enough. Maybe you'll be uh, wind surfing on uh, Gray's Lake. You're going to take that up, you know, since you've moved further south in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I think I might venture outside again now that the ice has melted and there's no danger from slipping <laughs> That's right. while exercising. You were being cautious in that. I'm regard. sure I can find some way to be clumsy and injure myself. Have you been to, I know this is, people are like, what are they even talking about at this point? Have you been to Ledges State Park yet? I have not. Uh, we all need is to it? take, like, we need to bring the whole uh, Mar Bonner children to wear them out, but... I, it's it's amazing because you actually go in down into the ledges, but yeah. when you're there, it looks like you're hiking up mountains in the middle of Iowa. Yeah, there are some beautiful areas. I, you know, as someone who grew up in Omaha, you'd think because of the proximity of the two cities that the geography and terrain is all very much the same. But in Omaha, once you get uh, ten miles west of the Missouri River, the, the landscape goes forever. The horizon just stretches out, stretches out almost infinitely. But here in Iowa, we have, I mean, you could speak to this more because this is one of your hobby horses, but we have more water, I think. Mm. I mean, more waterways. Very much so. Uh, more hills. And then aren't we sitting on mineral resources? That's right. Yeah, Oops. well, I mean, the biggest mineral resource is just how nice all of the soil is up here. I always yeah. complain how easy it is to grow. Not to, like, pick fights with farmers at the very beginning of our show, but, yeah, you know, you go further north, it's amazing how much corn they can grow you know but i wish i could say that like being in iowa as long as we have that we've really gone and seen the sites but we've mostly like found the the area ice cream shops that everybody talks about so it's mostly not very healthy but we have ventured out to go find bad food to eat like in pella and places like that yeah i I need to be more adventure adventurous in that respect although I, i do have to say since moving back this time I have been hitting the trails quite a bit. I don't go at a fast pace, but yeah, no, same I, here. I am a, I am impressed in Des Moines with the city planning. They did think about some wooded trails. So, starting from my house in Windsor Heights, I, I biked the other day out. I mean, it was past Waukee. There's I, I don't know. So it's it's a nice thing to have. Yeah, no, we uh, go down to what the uh, the Bill Riley Trail, and then that goes over by um saint augustine's and stuff like that and you can really forget that you're supposedly in farmland country um yeah you can even go out e- uh, east here and there's a place where they have uh bison buffalo to eat or look at to look at okay. yeah no i mean it's a a state park they would look down on the eating part at least initially so uh no but as always uh to, to wrap this around uh Underwritten by Mercy College of Health Sciences, like we said, finished a semester, getting ready to start a new one. Uh, Still time to join up for the summer, if you're so inclined, mchs.edu. Yeah, a lot of good things going on at the college. And, uh, Bo, I don't know if you took advantage of this, but Monday, the hospital, Mercy One, was doing an appreciation pancake breakfast. Uh, So after I listened to your talk at the cathedral, I swung by and did um, pancakes and sausage at the (laughs) the medical center. It's like... 
Now that I'm revved up after Bo's talk, I need to have some pancakes. That's right. Double dipping in downtown uh, extravagance, right? You get to hear a talk at the cathedral and then go get pancakes over at Mercy One. <laughs> well, it was nice because sometimes when you hear it, I was thinking like cafeteria pancakes because we had like the take-home containers. But they were um, – they had the big griddle right there. They were doing them fresh. Oh, wow. So – yeah, uh, you know, when we've uh, been able to do stuff, that reminds me of uh, on Fat Tuesday, we always get uh, Chris Cakes, and they, they have the whole operation. So looking forward to be able to maybe do some of that stuff when everybody gets back on campus. Catholic identity is great because of the Catholic intellectual tradition, but Catholics also have very creative ways of saying, like, how can we <laughs> work food and drink into this celebration? I know it's around my birthday. There's There's Mercy Day. Is it associated with the founding of the order? Yeah, on September 24th. And there we drink tea, but I'm always like, we need crumpets and <laughs> pastries too, right? Yeah, no, I have to, we have to give a shout out to uh, Hillary Ware who brought in, um, uh, not crumpets, but... Bun, uh, bun cakes? No. no um. <laughs> you know, they look like trying. <laughs> They're British, it's the other one. Oh, man, we only have a minute before. Bo's right. repressed all of his knowledge about English culture. That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really striking out on the British things. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. Whatever uh, triangular pastries that you eat with tea. Yeah, the, not the, the, like the British answer to the croissant. Wow, we're <laughs> I'm having a moment. Anyway, we're looking to the behind the yeah, glasses. Jimmy, Jimmy doesn't want to make us eye out? contact. Yeah, like you, you don't know British patri- pastries? That is, that is a no. What do you eat with your tea, Jimmy? <laughs> uh, it's okay. We better talk about our guest for today. Yeah, well, I, we don't, luckily we don't need to like introduce much because when she gets uh, on it, she's going to be great. Uh, so Paige Courtney Soto, uh, who we're looking forward to talking about. Her book is Sacred Remedy, uh, a Catholic prayer book to atone for the sins of racism. Uh, Paige Courtney, uh, looking forward to having her on the show. So this is The Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Mar. stick around. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Folks, if you want to contact The Uncommon Good or Iowa Catholic Radio in general, you can do, through, do so through the Zip Whip line. 515-223-1150. 515-223-1150. The Zip Whip line. Hashtag UCG for the uncommon good. You can do things like help Bud and I remember what British pastry that we're trying to talk about, for instance. Uh, but Tell you, us about your favorite pastry. Your favorite pastries. Bison. <laughs> what you feel about bison or like the bison buffalo uh, debate, which what, what word do you use? That's it. Tell us about your favorite pastry, bison. <laughs> that's, that's the pastry, bison. I, not the Never one mind. I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the zip with line. <laughs> Five one five two two three eleven fifty. Five one five two two three eleven fifty. The zip whip line. Your way to talk to Iowa Catholic Radio. This is the Uncommon Good, Bob Bonner and Doctor Bud Marr, and we will be back right after this. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Lee and Eddie in the Morning provided by Bell Construction. Bell Construction is a roofing company. They specialize in residential re-roofs, like commercial jobs. Bell Construction. Five one five nine six three four four nine four. Bell Construction. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Catholic Women Now provided in part by Permar Security, a Catholic-owned family business providing security solutions for homes and businesses since 1953. Permar Security, 515-244-5660, permarsecurity.com. Are you ready for the Iowa Catholic Radio Golf Classic? Presented by the Liturgical Institute. Golf, build community, and have fun. Wednesday, June 23rd at Legacy Golf Club in Norwalk. Shotgun start at 10 a.m. Sign up at iowacatholicradio.com slash events. There are millions of children that go hungry every day. Thank you to Skeffington's Formalware for supporting Mary's Meals. Their vision is that every child in the world should be able to receive at least one good meal every day in a place of education. Mary'sMealsUSA.org Thank you, Ashworth Vision Clinic, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365 on Iowa Catholic Radio. Ashworth Vision Clinic online at ashworthvision.com. Ashworth Vision Clinic, 515-440-4610. Thank you, Dental Associates, for supporting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. Dental Associates, addressing your smile, needs, and dreams, 515-225-6742. Online at Des Moines-DentalAssociates.com. Thank you, Big Red Q Quick Print, for underwriting the sports report. Family owned and operated since 1980, Big Red Q Quick Print is a full service print shop, ready to help you with all your printing needs with speed and accuracy. BigRedQ-Des Moines.com. 
Thank you, Golden Rule Plumbing, Heating, and Cooling, for sponsoring my show. John Lee and Eddie in the Morning on Iowa Catholic Radio. Golden Rule, servicing Des Moines for over 15 years. They obey the rules to live by, especially the Golden Rule. Online at goldenrulephc.com. We're back with the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this Wednesday. Thank you for listening to the show. Today we have with us special guest Paige Courtney Soto, uh, who has a PA in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame, an MA in teaching from Aquinas College in Nashville. She is the author of Sacred Remedy, a Catholic prayer book to atone for the sin of racism. Paige Courtney, thank you for joining the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to jump in this morning. Now, first of all, I want to point out, uh, so you've recently been married, so congratulations, uh, Paige Courtney Soto. But to I bring that up to make sure if people are looking for your website or your book, currently uh, under Paige Courtney Barnes, if, uh, but just at the top of the show, do you mind telling people where they can go to find more of your work in that regard? Yes. So my main website is my blog, and it's blackcatholicprose.com. Um, so you don't have to worry about the name confusion with my blog. Uh, just remember blackcatholicprose.com. And also my book has its own URL, sacredremedy.info. Um, but yes, I was just recently married, so most of my writing's under my maiden name, and then I'm just now um, have a new name. Fantastic. Well, again, congratulations, and we're glad to have you on the show. So just, you know, first of all, uh, uh, I'm not going to bore the readers with, like, the five million ways it turns out I know people who know you, which already seems to be like a providential (laughs) thing. Um, But uh, reading your book, Sacred Remedy, one of the things that really jumps out to me is I know when Catholics um, engage in dialogue about racism and what that might mean, uh, I think they share a sentiment you put there that, there's there's so much in our tradition that should help us speak through and understand and uh and and contemplate and talk together about what's going on in America in regards to racism that sometimes it, it seems like uh either it's not on the tip of our tongue it's not accessed so if i don't if you don't mind starting out with your book was that maybe something that came to mind when you wrote the book is that sort of uh uh, distance between the tradition and dealing with this important issue? Oh, 100%, because actually my, my inspiration from the book um, was back really at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement um, when Michael Brown was killed. Um, that's when I first started writing, and then it just kind of came slowly and evolved um, it, until re- the summer of 2020 when there was, of course, a big awakening with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Um, and Ahmaud Aubrey. So it, it really has evolved um, throughout, you know, just the more frequent, frequently recorded instances of police brutality against black persons. Um, but what really was striking to me um, is that, you know, there is a secular answer, right, throughout all social media, on TV, everywhere. But as Catholics, we have this treasury that, that we've benefited from, from centuries of how to deal with social justice issues. And I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of Catholics get bogged down with a political response and a secular response when I actually firmly believe that we should be turning the conversation for the rest of the world and really bring the gifts of the faith to really elevate this conversation to how has society secular solutions fallen short and how can supernatural solutions bridge the gap well i think that that's critical and 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 sad sadly lacking uh like you said in in the ability for catholics to bring exactly that lens to the issue i even think of very practical ones to start out with and i think it's a good way to jump into so much of what your book and your writings point out but i know sometimes people go well with racism, what if I myself have not racist? Or what if I myself have not done X, Y, and Z? But we go back to, again, the Catholic tradition. If you talk about something like the difference between uh, the eternal and temporal uh, ramifications of sin, uh, there's all sorts of ways, of course, in which we believe we're still dealing with the sins of other people. We're not eternally damned because of what they've done. But we have to wrestle with that. That's what original sin is, etc. So when you mm-hmm. talk about the temporal effects of sin, it should be very natural for Catholics to understand that while I personally, and I, we can get into like how much that this is actually ever the case, but if I personally can <laughs> truly say 
that I've never committed these sins, still we as a community have to wrestle with the temporal effects of not only a few but hundreds of years of sin. And so this doesn't mean that we have to operate, so to speak, under a cloud of guilt. We just have to be honest about the veil of tears and how Christ's grace can break in to, to, to enlighten what's going on in the world. Absolutely. And I think, again, as you alluded to, um, I really think it's, it's, it's hard to say that anyone <laughs> has not, um, in some regard, had some sort of prejudice or bias, um, you know, in, in their practice. But just as you said, we've, in some sense, you know, most Americans of European descent have benefited from um, racist structures in our society. And it's just, and that's why I actually begin with history um, in most of my discussions and then pivot back to an examination of conscience. Because I think if we just remind ourselves of American history, it's pretty easy to understand um, and acknowledge the temporal effects of the sin of racism and then how um, there's some level of cooperation. Um, and I think, you know, if we just look to, for instance, Jim Crow South, and if we look to the way that housing and redlining has come about, where black persons have been relegated to certain neighborhoods um, in not just the South, but really throughout all of America. Um, and and then how does that play forward to where people are living now in suburban America? And it's just, again, it's so pervasive that we really have to have a discriminating eye to say, okay, in what avenue have I actually benefited from the bias in our country? And can I actually, if I don't acknowledge that, am I guilty of actually a sin of omission for actually benefiting and then having a blind eye to that? No, this is uh, absolutely the case here in Des Moines at Mercy College. We um, had uh, someone come in to give a talk about redlining in Des Moines. And so Iowa, northern city, right, famously has all sorts of Union soldiers that fight for Gen- General Sherman. But they have the maps. They showed us the maps, right? Des Moines, the, you know, this is not Oklahoma City or, you know, uh, Nashville or something like this. Des Moines has this as well. And so that was, I think, eye-opening um, for people at Mercy College. But and I know that in our classes, uh, you, you've talked about this in terms of things like Omaha and uh, where uh, highways go in and things like this. Yeah, right. um, certainly in where I uh, was raised in Omaha, just a real quick aside, uh, you know, as you go west from the Missouri River, you go into more and more affluent neighborhoods, and there was kind of like one thoroughfare into downtown. And so when the city started to think about easing traffic congestion, the solution they ultimately landed on was um, building kind of a highway over another road. And, of course, this this bypassed all sorts of neighborhoods that were already struggling. But it's, it is it is a good reminder to us as Catholics that these questions like how we even construct roads, they're not you know, morally neutral or just something that we can sort of like brush aside. They really do have real-world implications. But, uh, Paige Courtney, uh, you mentioned drawing upon the resources of the Catholic tradition. I think Catholic social teaching, of course, gives us a lot to work with. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about, you know, sometimes I think uh, when we read sacred scripture, we might think some these topics are, um, you know, not there. But how has your own reading of scripture maybe informed how you talk about um, racism and and racist structures? Yes, um, I actually very purposefully, intentionally wove scripture throughout, um, again, my book, because I really wanted it to be a prayer book, more so than one more book out there on racism, um, because I firmly believe that this is a problem that we have to intercede to God um, for grace and for help, and so we have to begin with scripture and with prayer and with sacrament um, in order for us to get like that divine grace. And so the first scripture passage, I I really just start with Genesis, and I go back to to Cain and Abel, and I begin with that quote, you know, your your brother's blood, you know, cries out to me from the ground. And I think when we, again, when we go back and we talk to original sin, you know, it's nothing new that people and cultures are in conflict, right? (laughs) Like, that that is a, a perpetual problem throughout various societies. Um, but what we have to remind ourselves of is, again, every single person is obviously dear to God, a unique soul created by God. And so we can't have apathy towards persons, and that just gets back to, again, an examination of conscience and doing our due diligence 
to be concerned for our neighbor because what we have right now is apathy for our brother's blood. And so what I want to do is I want to stir up that concern. Um, So first of all, just beginning with the mindset of, again, from this passage in Genesis, that we have to be as solicitous for the suffering of our neighbor as God himself. Well, I would have to say even like the cover of your book, uh, I think, uh, <laughs> speaks to this fact of this is a prayer book. And I uh, commend you on even uh, that choice about artwork cover. Um, but, but even further, the name Sacred Remedy um, precisely as the idea of what do we think will, will change um, on the ground uh, situ- how things are, but how will it change us? So like you said, that eyes that are shut to certain realities become open. And, uh, you know, when I think of Sacred Remedy, I think of the sort of like long tradition in in gospel music of something like there's a balm in Gilead, right? That we think that there is a a way that we can turn to the Lord and ask, how can we smooth over and tend to wounds uh, long standing in the human community precisely because we believe that Jesus Christ is the divine physician? And so I'm guessing um, part of that goes into your choice of naming the book Sacred Remedy? Oh, absolutely. And also to pivot from a justice alone mindset to a reconciliation and fraternal charity mindset. Um, and I have to, to give homage to Father John LaForge because I totally ripped off fraternal charity <laughs> from, from um, a Jesuit priest who was actually doing work in the 1930s. He actually was an executive editor of America magazine. Um, and what father, it's interesting, I didn't know this before I picked up, I happened to pick up this book and um, the, the title is a little dated. It's called The Race Question and the Negro, but don't be afraid of the title. <laughs> the, the content is really good. And, and what I found in this book was actually Father LaForge traveled from New York to actually Nashville, Tennessee, my own hometown. And he did some pretty intense anthropological and sociological research, um, in particular at the historically black colleges here, Meharry Medical College, Tennessee State University, Fisk University. And what he was setting out to do was, from a social science perspective, just um, disprove racism. But he was just inspired to write about how, even as he began his project as a social scientist, there, um, as you know, even in the 30s, we're, we're on the eve of the civil rights movement, and there's just this this emphasis on justice, and rightly so. But he, again, he said, as Catholics, what we're concerned about is fraternal charity, love of our neighbor. And so, yes, justice is step one, 100%. We cannot minimize the need for justice. However, justice only gets us so far, and I think that is so clear, you know. And we can't legislate, um, you know, love of neighbor, right? We can legislate justice, but what happened? Even after we legislated civil rights protections, we still have instances of prejudice and bias and um, police brutality. But if we pivot towards a real conversion of heart so that I am motivated to love my neighbor as myself, that's where social change can come about. I love that story about Father LaForge, and I'm, I'm motivated now after the show to do a little bit more research myself. I think for our listeners, it's, it's good and important to hear those stories of faithful witness in, in relation to this, do you have? Um, this is a really broad question, but um, would you, could you point to other examples, maybe historically, of saints or or Catholic figures who have who have done this really well and left us a shining example? Or if not, maybe in our own day, you know, uh, persons or communities that are are really you know making a, a good faith effort, right? Um, one community I point to and I write about, um, there's, a, there's a Dominican um, convent, the Convent of St. Jude in Marbury, Alabama, who are actually social justice warriors <laughs> in their own right. Um, and, and I did a profile on one of their sisters who was actually the first African-American member of their community. Um, and so, again, I can't do their story justice in brief, but... Um, the short version is that that convent itself, the foundation, was the fruit of a mystical vision um, that the foundress had of, again, it was right on the eve of the Civil Rights Movement, and the foundress um, in a vision saw Martin de Porres, um, and he was in the middle of a race riot holding up a rosary. And she was so moved by this vision that she knew that God was calling her 
um, to specifically pray the rosary perpetually for an end to racial violence in America. And she began doing that in her community and felt another call within a call to start the first interracial religious community for women religious. And, and that was really unheard of even at that time. And so that community founded um, in Marbury, Alabama, and is still present to this day. And I recently did a profile on, on their first African-American member, um, and her name was Sister Mary of the Rosary. Had a great devotion, again, to perpetual recitation of the rosary. And, and those are the stories that I just want to amplify. Is Again, if we just dig through our Catholic history, there are those figures, and figures who are not just 18th or 19th century, but really, um, Sister Mary of the Rosary, she entered the convent in 1925 and just recently passed. And so there are uh, contemporary figures we can really look to, and honestly, we should be praying um, for their causes for canonization. Yeah, I was actually going to say one of the things driving over here as I prayed the rosary this morning and thought of uh, Sister <laughs> precisely because of uh, the story in the book. And um, I think that that's, you, 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 at the end of the book, you make a good point to this. We're, we're coming up on the first break here in about three-ish minutes. But, but briefly, right, I, I think that it's important, like you said, that uh, whatever we do to, to do the work, uh, we, we can't let it, like you said, ling- linger in the abstract. And so it's one, important on one hand to think about how do these ideas get embodied uh, in people, but then also that when we do that too, not to, so to speak, abstract the person, make a, a sort of hagiography hey around them that excludes them from speaking to us now and that what we can continue to do in the here and now. Exactly. And that's why we have to very specifically pray not only for an end to the sin of racism, um, but we should be praying for persons who are victims of police brutality by name to honor um, and reverence the names of persons whose lives, you know, weren't reverenced. And then we should be, again, I and that's why I wrote through the book, you know, specific questions that can appeal to us Personally, like in my daily life, do I surround myself with persons who look just like me? In my daily life at church, um, are there even persons of color present? And if not, can I be a part of outreach at church so that if there's a Catholic school, are there persons of color, children of color that are able to be scholarshiped into school? You know, there are very concrete things we can do to make our immediate circle of influence and then our circle of influence at Mass um, and in our Catholic community um, really just reflect the ideals that we believe in. Well, and and as you said, there, people, again, one more time, it's the, the concreteness of this also matters too. So even the ability to learn about what things might look like in different contexts will lead us, so to speak, uh, to different concrete Actions. I think sometimes this is what, um, as someone who grew up in the South, I notice that people will will make this a Southern problem or it will be a city oh. problem, <laughs> and uh, that's just to say that I think people should just learn about the histories of their cities anyway, because often there's just beautiful things they're missing, but they're also missing, like you said, the, the ways in which we can concretely make this uh, a question about racism. Uh, alive for us here and now, even in places where maybe uh, it's not the South or it's not a big metropolis. Absolutely. Um, so uh, we're going to hit the break here. This is uh, the Uncommon Good Bob Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr coming to you from Iowa Catholic Radio. We have Paige Courtney Soto on the line. She's going to stick around, so make sure to stick around after the break. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Folks, if you want to stay connected to Iowa Catholic Radio, it's easy to do. Just follow us on social media. You can follow us at iowacatholicradio.com, where you can listen live, donate, see what's up with everybody else, see what pictures of what people look like, all the things you would like to do on a website. You can also go to facebook.com and uh, go to Iowa Catholic Radio, and then you can be friends with us on Facebook and then see all of our posts and all the wonderful things that happen when you are a Facebook friend. On Twitter, you can follow at IA Catholic Radio, see all of our tweets. But finally, you can download the Iowa Catholic Radio app, and wherever you have a connection to data, you can listen to Iowa Catholic Radio. 
you can listen to two different uh, stations of music. We have positive radio, uh, positive music, and we have sacred music both running all the time. Other prayers you can donate there as well. And then if you have, if you're on speaking terms with Alexa, you know how to do that. You can make Alexa do Iowa Catholic radio stuff as well. This is the Uncommon Good, and we'll be back right after this. Are you ready for the Iowa Catholic Radio Golf Classic? Presented by the Liturgical Institute. Golf, build community, and have fun. Wednesday, June 23rd at Legacy Golf Club in Norwalk. Shotgun start at 10 a.m. Sign up at iowacatholicradio.com slash events. Hi, this is Joe Stopulus. Thank you to construction professionals for underwriting Man Up. Monday mornings at 9 on Iowa Catholic Radio. Construction professionals, a Catholic family business built on a strong foundation. cpcustomhomes.com Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Catholic Women Now provided in part by Permar Security, a Catholic-owned family business providing security solutions for homes and businesses since 1953. Permar Security, 515-244-5660, permarsecurity.com. Here's your forecast on Iowa Catholic Radio. Low pressure is moving along a nearly stationary front, but that's off to our south. But we do still have a chance of a shower or thunderstorm today. Temperature in the upper 60s and a little bit breezy. Overnight, low 50s and maybe a shower in the evening. And then tomorrow, we're back to sunny weather. It will be gusty and our afternoon high about 70. The upcoming weekend looks fair with highs mainly in the 70s. I'm meteorologist Steve Hamilton on Iowa Catholic Radio. There are millions of children that go hungry every day. Thank you to Skeffington's Formal Wear for supporting Mary's Meals. Their vision is that every child in the world should be able to receive at least one good meal every day in a place of education. Mary'sMealsUSA.org Thank you, Ashworth Vision Clinic, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365 on Iowa Catholic Radio. Ashworth Vision Clinic online at ashworthvision.com. Ashworth Vision Clinic, 515-440-4610. Thank you, Golden Rule Plumbing, Heating, and Cooling, for sponsoring my show. John Lee and Eddie in the Morning on Iowa Catholic Radio. Golden Rule, servicing Des Moines for over 15 years. They obey the rules to live by, especially the Golden Rule. Online at (laughs) goldenrulephc.com. Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this Wednesday. Today, our guest on the show is Paige Courtney Soto, philosophy uh, degree from University of Notre Dame, MA in teaching from Aquinas College in Nashville. Her book is Sacred Remedy, a Catholic prayer book to atone for the sin of racism. Paige Courtney, thanks for coming back on the show. Yes, I'm so happy to talk with you guys this morning. So, one of we're talking about using resources from the Catholic tradition to better understand how we're going to address racism and not leave it simply to the secular world. One thing I think about, and of course, this is coming up because of things like vaccines and taxes and stuff like this, is the moral distinction between remote and proximate cooperation with evil. And the reason I bring that up is one more time: it can sometimes be strange or confusing for some folks to go. But if I don't personally do anything, and as we've already addressed, most everyone has either, at least by sins of omission, has failed in this regard. But even if you're just positing in a sort of like vacuum, well, what if I haven't done anything? We have to go back to this idea about how cooperation with evil is pretty much, in our world, incapable of being surmounted. Uh, You go back to Paul himself in Romans, instructs Christians to pay taxes to the very Roman Empire that are persecuting them, because, of course, there's not an easy way to extract the fact that we should pay for the common good, knowing that our rulers might do something else with it. So when it comes to us understanding why, even if I myself try to do all that I can not to to have uh, prejudice or bias or racism towards people, we still participate, even if it's remotely, with evils that have either gone on in the past or continue to do so. With that in mind, is that maybe a way forward for people to, I, I don't know, not, I don't want people not to take it personally, but I think you know what I'm driving at here, that sometimes the sort of personal like idea like, but I don't want to be this way, prevents us from walking uh, with that discomfort to actually address racism on the ground. Absolutely. And and that's why I really do beat the drum of an examination of conscience. I think at the end of the day, um, we really do have to just be open to letting the Holy Spirit, you know, enlighten our mind and heart about the reality of sin. 
and and when we talk about cooperation with sin, um, I think the 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 focal point I really like to bring is that is that we're dealing with wounds, you know, that have been inflicted on the body of Christ. So whether or not I myself have inflicted those wounds, there is a reality that there are wounds present on the body of Christ. And so when we look at it in that vein, I think every single um, Catholic and every single Christian really is interested in healing those wounds, and, and that's really the first step of reconciliation, um, you know, on a social level, is, is healing wounds. And so that's one way that I frame it um, when I dialogue with persons who have not yet recognized the ways that they are um, personally participating in sin, but still, if we're looking at it in terms of social sin, what we're really doing is there are those um, lingering effects, right, of these wounds, and that's what we can, every single person can chip away at. Yeah, um, Paige Courtney, one thing that I like to do on the show is put on my miter's hat and pretend to be bishop for a day. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not, no, not, not really. But, uh, you know... Um, I'll be honest, like Bo's mentioned sin, sins of omission. I think one omission can sometimes be to say like, well, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to say the wrong thing, you know? And uh, our, our bishops and pastors have addressed this, uh, have addressed racism at different times. But if you, I, I don't know, besides handing out your book at the local parish, like if pastors say, I really have this impulse to to want to speak prophetically and truthfully to racism— where where might they start in thinking about like how to how to address those topics and within their communities right and again the the refrain i always use is that and and even when i dialogue with priest friends is to just to switch and flip on the, our, the its head this notion that racism is a political problem because the reality is and if we're going to talk about you know that the catholic elephant in the room we've let you know political division really invade our church and we've let ourselves be divided in the same exact way that our country is divided, but our church should be above and beyond that. You know, the truth is above and beyond that. And I think the first way of addressing that issue is to just look at racism as sin. And just as you said, you know, sin is a reality, and we all have some level of participation in the reality of sin, and we all have um, an obligation to root out sin in our hearts, and on the positive, we all benefit, right, <laughs> when sin is more um, deeply rooted out of our hearts and out of our society. And so I encourage priest friends um, to just talk about it as sin. And, you know, one uh, quote I actually ran across when I was researching my book is, was from a Dominican prior, and he said, you know, he, has, he literally acknowledged that he has never heard anyone confess the sin of racism, you know, and it wasn't breaking the seal of confession. He didn't mention names, yeah. but just generally speaking, he has never had anyone come to him and confess the sin of racism. And I think that's telling, you know, because the truth is, if no one was committing the sin, then we wouldn't have, you know, the staggering injustice that we have today. And so I just think that we really have to call to test this idea of even just speaking out the reality of this problem is not political, it's sinful. Well, something to briefly add before Bo's question, in, in the classroom when he and I have taught, I think one obstacle that we've faced is reducing Christianity to completely an individualistic thing. So you kind of hinted at this at the beginning of the show, but one of the effects of sin, and you see this early on in Genesis— is not simply person's individual lives are worsened, but there's really a division among peoples. With Adam and and, and Eve, there's you know they're they're one. They have this kind of uh, intrinsic unity to the human family. But once sin enters the picture, you see this division, and really much of the Old Testament narrative is uh, you know like the strife between peoples. And so when you get to the New Testament, and especially I think at Pentecost. It really is about not only reconciling myself as an individual with God, but this kind of, you know, restoring an original peace and unity among peoples where sin had created division. Exactly. And that's actually the positive that I like to speak about with, you know, when we're able to address racism as sin, we're also able to look at the remedy more closely as grace, right? Grace is the healing power um, 
for sin, and, and what does grace show us, what does the Holy Spirit show us, that actually, if in the positive, race is a gift from God. And I just, I firmly reduce, you know, the destru- deconstruction notions that race is a social construct, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think there's a very strong argument from a biblical worldview that race in, and culture and ethnicity are gifts that God gave humanity. They're expressions, you know, of God's infinite beauty in humanity. And I think if we reclaim um, the reality of race as actually a gift from God, then we can move forward actually as saying, you know, again, through the, the communion of saints, if we acknowledge that actually there should be this diverse um, company of persons who are give, or who are examples and are witnesses to heroic virtue and holiness. And so that's why we're so concerned about having more black saints, more Asian saints, um, you know, in addition to saints of European descent, because that's more faithful to actually the gifts that God has given to all of humanity. Right, that's more faithful to the vision of the book of Revelation about the, the divine choir in heaven at the end of time. I'm, I even think about this. You're exactly right. When we when we allow the politics of the secular world to drive this, this can make everything seem uh, very uh, contemporary and like these these things have just arisen. But I mean, if you want to be a good traditionalist, you know, the Enlightenment thinkers <laughs> who who caused so much trouble for the church, a lot of times they just had straight up heretical notions to defend their racism. <laughs> they they had ideas like polygenesis, which we can't believe, right? Like they thought the different races were literally completely different uh, trees. Like yeah, spe- <laughs> right. I mean, no, that's mm-hmm. that is heresy, and I think sometimes right. that's like you said, the issue is not that we're unwilling. We're unwilling to speak boldly enough about it, like to to bring the tradition to bear. Racism is heresy, actually. To think this about the division of mankind as essentialist divisions, um, or to like you said, to, to do the opposite, which is to to sort of uh, strip humanity down to just like some sort of bare bones common essence, and then everything else is mere accident. Seems both are seem to be heretical as to what God does when He creates humanity and what He does when He governs the growth of humanity and human cultures. Exactly, and what we're doing again. Not only are we shrinking God's infinite nature down to what we can understand in our you know um, limited human capacity, but we're we're missing you know the gift of revelation of what every single thing that God reveals, including creation, right, is a gift of what not only he is, but what he wants to do in us through grace. And so that's one thing that I really like to emphasize is that we don't want to miss out on what God is teaching us about ourselves and about himself and what we can do to really enter in by grace into the vision and the hope, actually, that God has for us. I think uh, with with this conversation, we've... Uh, we've been kind of dancing around some of the issues in a good way. I don't mean that, you know, like like avoiding, but just like some of the recurring themes that have been woven throughout the conversation. And one that I think um, we, we touched on a little bit but could be unpacked a bit further is this question of how we think about organizing our parishes. And what comes to mind for me is sacred art. And in the Catholic tradition, I, I guess my, my thoughts go to the Basilica in D.C., where if you go into the lower part of the church— there's all these representations of of Mary from the perspective of different cultures and these apparitions even that have taken place in different parts of the world. But even something like sacred art or perhaps, I don't know, this one might be pushing the envelope further, but the Stations of the Christ, I mean the Stations of the Cross, excuse me, like um, at, as parishes we need to be intentional, right, about like, like you're saying, do we have saints represented from more than our own culture, Oh, yeah. And I, you know, I echo the sentiment of John Paul II, who says, you know, art actually stirs up love, right? And so, again, if we're looking at remedies to heal hatred or bias, we need to stir up love, and art is one of the main instruments to do that. So I think it's absolutely true um, that we should have more depictions of of diverse saints um, that are more true really to what the communion of saints look like. And I think it's not just art, like physical art in churches. I think it's also bringing about more diverse Catholic literature. 
Um, and I've actually been working very closely with a group of black Catholic authors and, and we're working to, um, with actually major publishers to push out more black Catholic literature. Um, because, and another, th- you know, elephant in the room to throw out there was, um, you know, I, I won't call out the press by name, but, but recently a major, um, Catholic publishing company, um, published the first narrative of the, um, candidates for sainthood, um, African-American candidates for sainthood. And no, no one, you know, spoke about the fact that the editor of these narratives um, was a person of European descent. And so what we have over and over again is, like, not only are these depictions and art missing, but then when there's an opportunity to tell the black Catholic story, um, you know, all of a sudden um, black Catholic authors are not given an opportunity to tell our own story. And so I think art is certainly um, a firm foundation to to begin to bring about um, a greater knowledge and appreciation of culture, but also the social change of amplifying black Catholic voices. Well, and as someone who uh, loves this city to death for the food alone, because I uh, it, it's easy to impre- uh, yeah yeah I just like food too much. It's insane <laughs> that New Orleans can have such a large cultural imprint on the mind of Americans, but. But its rootedness in black Catholicism does not. I, I have to admit, I'm infinitely confused by the fact that everybody can sort of know what it's like, you know, like what, what New Orleans stands for and all these things. And I know this is just one community. I'm just bringing it up to sort of make the example. But the idea that you can know about New Orleans t- till the, the day is long, but you're not going to uh, immediate when we start talking about, well, well it's kind of hard to find like black Catholics or like, what are the black Catholic stories? You're like, really? Like New Orleans, <laughs> Louisiana. I mean, it's right there. And I mean, you know, Chicago, I can, so we can replicate so many places about this, but I, I just think New Orleans is the standing easy example. And how many times, I, I mean, I've done this and brought this up and people have gone like, Oh yeah. And I, it's like, if you could distill the essence of that, Oh Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> we would get to a lot of uh, the, the foundations of what we're talking about today. Right. I mean, and, and another refrain I have is really a simple Google search will suffice <laughs> to find all those black Catholic voices that um, just aren't amplified yet. Oh, yeah. And so um, we're getting to where we have about like six minutes left. So uh, like like always happens when we start to have good discussions, I'm always <laughs> thinking, oh, I have questions that would only prompt another hour long discussion. So I'm, I'm, tr- I'm going to try to be uh, concise, <laughs> which is hard for me. <laughs> um, when we talk about uh, why there... <laughs> It's like you said. So if you go do Google searches or DuckDuckGo, if we don't want to give Google credit, uh, you know, there's easy ways that we can go ask people. Or we, we can go look and we can do um, our own research. But, you know, this backs up to a bigger question of when people say, oh, well, here's um, th- th- an unrelated thing. Um, here, here's studies that show that, you know, this huge percentage of Catholics don't know what we really believe about uh, the Blessed Sacrament or, oh, this many Americans don't know blank. What do you think? It, it, it's, it's frustrating in a common theme of this show that there is more information available to everyone worldwide than there ever has been. But it almost seems like with the increase of ease to do so, there's a... a there's almost an equal force to to not really dive into these things. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you have you and your work found a good way to bridge that gap? Uh, of course, when we talk about racism, but really with anything, where the, the the sources are there, but people are frozen or complacent or whatever it is. Um, so I know that that's a very open-ended question, but that, that starts to hit up on a lot of frustration that I think Bud and I have continually brought up in this show, talking about different aspects of Catholic social teaching, is it really is there for the learning, but the desire has to be there first. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's why, again, I say step one is if you're really serious about this um, rooting sin out period from your life and from society— then begin with prayer, and I firmly believe that the Holy Spirit, you know, will direct people even to the first place to begin in their immediate circle of influence, and then um, in society at large for, you know, digging up stories and sharing stories. And so one thing I always say, again, is is we cannot 
underemphasize the power of prayer in this issue because I I just firmly believe that this is one of the things where um, you know God does not withhold good gifts from His children, and we've already been caught in this stalemate. You know, and so if we're going to overcome the impasse that we've been stuck at for centuries, <laughs> then it has to be really an action of grace, and we have to go to prayer first. And I think once we begin with prayer, then the Holy Spirit does direct us to the next step, whether it's I myself, am I going to cultivate a de- and devotion to a black saint, and am I going to spread that devotion throughout my entire prayer group at church, or I myself, am I going to become a, bear- a better historian of American history, learn more about my city, and then speak the truth? You know, I think that beginning with prayer actually helps our actions be more focused, and it helps us bring about, again, a more real change. Oh, yeah, and I only convict myself to say, like, I'm frustrated and I didn't think of prayer, so thank you for <laughs> reminding me to do that. So, Bud, last question. We're, we're kind of getting at the end of the show here. No, I think that's great. Uh, this closing on prayer, and the great theologians talk about the Holy Spirit as uncreated grace, and I think it really will be a movement of the Holy Spirit that brings about the healing that and the reconciliation that we've been talking about on the show. I guess... Um, this is more of a comment, but maybe if you have uh, something to add, um, you know, John Paul II during his pontificate, one of his re- like constant refrains was "Be not afraid." And during our own time in American history, I think it's easy to start to say like, "I, I you know, I, I'm tired of this," or like this. It feels like a burden. But would would you say like this is actually the difficulties that we're facing is an opportunity for the church to speak truth? to Americans who might be outside the church. 100% and a tremendous opportunity for evangelization. <laughs> like, I think we have to be more missionary minded and and that's one thing I always preach about too is that like, you know, it's again from a black catholic perspective what what many people will say is well, you know, there just aren't black people coming to the church or why won't black people come to the church? And the flip side of that is you have an entire pool of people who are not Catholic simply because there hasn't been a, an imp, an adequate amount of knowledge given about the Catholic Church and a gracious invitation to <laughs> attend the Catholic Church. And so you have this, you know, tremendous opportunity for evangelization. And so I think we do have to think about it as one of those Catholic moments where, yes, we have, you know, we're not all civil rights lawyers. There's a lot of work to be done in society to um, really reform broken systems, and we can't all do that work. But what every single one of us can do is actually open up our eyes and preach the gospel and make the Catholic faith vibrant and attractive, and that's, you know, that's the solution, and that's the best thing we can do. Uh Paige Courtney, this has been uh, a wonderful, blessed uh, opportunity to get to talk to you. I'm so happy that you got to come on the show and um, speak about all this. And, and so just one more time, the book is Sacred Remedy, a Catholic prayer book to atone for the sin of racism. But if you don't mind plugging where they can go find that on the Internet and also your other writing, uh, if you, yeah, please do that for us. So my main website is blackcatholicprose.com. Um, that's where you can find both the blog and actual additional resources for Catholic authors and Black Catholic literature resources, as well as sacredremedy.info is the specific URL for the book. Paige Courtney Soto, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it so much. Thank you for having me, and you guys have a blessed day. You too. Thank you. Uh, May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, our family, our city, our state, our nation, world, solar system, galaxy, the whole kit and caboodle. This is The Uncommon Good, and we'll be back next week. But if folks want to join us in the prayer life here at Iowa Catholic Radio, what are the ways they can do so? Uh, Please pray the rosary daily with us at 5.30 a.m., 9.30 a.m., and 9.30 p.m. Those are broadcasts uh, live on air. You can also pray the rosary anytime, anywhere, using the Iowa Catholic Radio app. A couple other prayer opportunities that we broadcast, the Angelus is prayed daily at 6 in the morning, and then the Divine Mercy Chaplet at 3 p.m. Also, uh, being with things opening up, there's ways that you can be involved with Iowa Catholic Radio events. You can find all these events at iowacatholicradio.com. 
The Iowa Catholic Men's Conference is Saturday, May 22nd at the Embassy Suites downtown, starting with Mass at 7 a.m. Speakers include Gary Dolphin, uh, the coach, not the animal, and Tim Jamison, uh, the person, not the, the drink, uh, hosted by Joe Stopulis and John Leonetti. Also, the Iowa Catholic Radio Golf Classic, presented by the Liturgical Institute, and Wednesday, is Wednesday, June 23rd. Bud and I are still trying to figure out if they're going to have liturgical golf, what that might look like. Uh, June 23rd at the Legacy Golf Club in Norwalk. Shotguns start at 10 a.m. Again, all of these things are online at iowacatholicradio.com, where you can find out more about them and figure out how to register uh, folks, this is a mission. This is a ministry. This is not just the guys or the gals that you hear yapping on the air. This is also not only the people the good, the, doing the good work behind the boards or in the office. This is your ministry as well. We survive because of your prayers, because of your volunteer work, but also because you materially support us. And we want to thank everyone who does. But please keep in mind that it is your donations that allow us to keep doing the good work of Iowa Catholic Radio. You can donate at iowacatholicradio.com on the Iowa Catholic Radio app, or you can call 515-223-1150 and set up ways to donate there. We want to say thank you for all your prayers, all your volunteer work, and all the material support that you allow for this ministry to proceed. Well, bud, um, talking about golf makes me realize that people are going to be out and about more and that I should probably uh, go out and about more, you know, Shed that winter uh, body, ready for a summer bod. I don't know if we're going to yeah, get there. Yeah, not a bad idea. I mean, another little sport um, tidbit before we go. Cubs are in last place. So <laughs> as, as we continue to watch the National League Central standing. <laughs> Shut it down. Days, Shut it down. That's uh, okay. We're being That's cut off there. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the Cardinals were just. <laughs> <laughs> we got stuff thrown That's at what us. the plastic foot is That's for. What, Cardinals were just in last place, so, you know, they uh, a little while ago. Things so. have changed. That's things, things have changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is The Uncommon Good, uh, and we'll be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu.